Peter asked me to interview him. 3,000 meters is not exactly what I expected. <laughs> but then again, isn't that Blue Orchard? To expect the unexpected. Either way, I'm taking him to task. Welcome everybody, you are watching the first in a series of 12 interviews that we're doing with Blue Orchard commemorating the 20 year anniversary of the Asset Manager. I'm joined now by the chairman, Peter Fanconi. Peter, it's always great to see you, but I, I, I have to ask you what we're doing at 3,000 meters. <laughs> <laughs> That's a strange opening for this interview, Anna Maria, but no, there are a couple of reasons of actually being here, I can tell you. Um, first of all, I love this place here. Well, what's We're, not to love, right? <laughs> well, for, mount, for mountaineer, he would definitely love this place. There are a lot of uh, nature people and mountaineers working in Blue Orchard as well, so mm -hmm. they will resonate for that. Mm -hmm. The um, second reason is actually, if I'm in Switzerland, I, I live close to the mountains, so that's important for me. But I think that the most important reasoning for having chosen this place here in the middle of the mountains is we are surrounded by glaciers. These are one of the last glaciers in Switzerland we still have. They are uh, melting crazy. Mm -hmm. So you were to do this uh, video sequence here, we wouldn't see the glaciers as they are here. It will be all rocks. And of course, this is also part of the effects of climate change, right? And whereas, you know, for a country like Switzerland, melting glaciers might have an effect on, on the power situation due to hydropower in countries like, like, like Nepal, Pakistan, or areas in India, the melting of glaciers have a total different effect. We estimate today that roughly 800 million people will be lacking water in 20 years due to the fact of the melting down of glaciers. And if we can find ways to really preserve glaciers, you know, it's one little piece in really fighting the effects of climate change. And uh, I can tell you, I mean, this is not really known to many people, but, but really the effects of the melting of the water in the Himalaya will, you know, increase migration flows, which we have not even thought about so far. So this is very, very accurate topic and maybe that's also the reason why I believe there is a connex between Blue Orchard and glaciers actually. Now Blue Orchard has really been um, a pioneer in the impact investing uh, sector, not only this but as you described female empowerment, um, education, um, always also on the frontier of these types of funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we always try to be the innovator. I mean, just imagine yourself 20 years ago, Blue Orchard was the first company out there trying to commercialize the topic of impact and commercialize it really meaning attracting financial institutions or investors in order for us to deploy that capital and money into frontier markets and to support. And the idea was always to do it commercially, so not by providing grants, but really trying to build a business, trying to make people entrepreneurial, providing a micro loan, but still having them to basically amortize or repay today. And I think we're actually very happy about that. Our competition has grown. There are a lot of banks, insurance group, other players who are moving into the sector helping you know to provide support to these countries so that's something we're all very open about i mean i think i still believe we deserve being the pioneer and will be that for many years to come because we've got the history but it's great to see these players are coming on board you know and one of one of, one of the greatest examples is our partner Schroders, for example you know one of the world's largest asset manager who decided to team up with a relatively small company like blue orchard and over the last two years, you know, we've been really able to, to create new products, to develop issues and topics. And not only has somebody like Shorter's impacted Blue Orchard, but also we as Blue Orchard believe have the ambition to impact such a great player like Shorter's. So there's a lot of leverage also in these kind of partnership and scale as well. And do you see this kind of partnership as like a sign of the times? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, for sure. Is this where it's impact investing is headed? Yeah, big time, big time. Because, you know, I mean, it has become a little bit uh, the new normal. I mean, if you also look at the millennials and how people start to invest, there's also new regulations coming into place in, in Europe, for example, 
where a lot of investments need to be sustainable or they need to hit the SDG goals. And impact, of course, is, is in the midst of that, of that universe. And if you really want to have an impact, and if you really want to deploy capital, you will need to do it with players like, like Blue Orchard who deploy capital where the most vulnerable really need the capital. So it's really, it sounds like it's just the impact investing movement is growing across the board. Yeah, that's how we see it. And of course, not only in frontier markets, but also in developed markets. We see a lot of funds. We see a lot of green bonds being launched lately. There might be also passive uh, products being launched. So I think this is something here to stay. But it's also reflecting, you know, a little bit our time, you know, the topic of climate change, what's going on in large institutions. I mean, you cannot avoid this theme as an investor because the individual will always ask, to have products in that regards. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why, why, why there's such a, such a high interest in also what we're doing. Just think about people wanting to work with us. You know, we receive on a weekly basis dozens and dozens of you know, highly educated people wow. who want to work with us. And that's maybe also a little bit showing you know, the interest the new generation actually has in the topic of impact. If we look back just for a few moments on these 20 years, I mean, you came on 10 years ago, right? More so less, yeah. more or less right. 10 yeah. years ago. What would you say, I know this, this question is always a tough one, but like a, a key learning? For me, it, it was just totally mind opening when I started to understand what impact investing is really about by, by really combining you know, financial markets and financial industry instruments with the fact by really having a local impact on the ground and helping millions of individuals who without our help or without the help of Blue Orchard would have never been able to really develop and would have also never been able to really escape the trap of poverty. And of course, you know, there are so many stories and I, you know, in normal times I, I, I travel a lot and being close to these stories and understand what, what just a couple of hundred dollars can really you know, have for an effect and save lives and, and change also two or three generations, if you think about education, is absolutely mind-blowing. So for me, you know, that, that was very much also mission-driven. I also believe for everybody working in our company and also the founders we had in the company, you know, we had people like Melchior de Muralt, we had Ernst Brucker, Omar Kandil, you know, great visionaries, Peter Harrison, the CEO of Schroders today, mm -hmm. Stephen Mills, and other great people. And they all share these views and values mm -hmm. and bring these views together and really shaping this company and also shaping the future of this asset class, I mean, that doesn't really make you sleep for lots, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, at the end of the day, I guess what you're saying is you can um, do good and make money. Yeah, exactly. That's, basic, right? that, that's the idea, right? I mean, it, the, the purpose is really, or the mission is really doing good and helping people. That's very clear. But of course, in order to attract finance and not just being a development aid institution, which is providing grants, mm -hmm. our investors, they always would expect that the invested capital is being reverted, right? So the only way to do that and also to grow is really having a commercial business and, and you know, and, and and uh, looking for capital, invest the capital, mm -hmm. but assure that our investors are also happy in regards to their yields and their impact. So it's always, it's always this double layer, so it's financial, but it's also impact and impact being really ecological and social. And this is uh, something that, you know, I know you're not going to say it, but to your credit, you know, the company was a bit on the brink when you came on board 10 years ago and gave it that commercialization, if we can use that word, mm -hmm. um, yeah, in order think, to grow the business. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's not me. These are over 100 people, best talents, you know, we have, uh, I believe, are situated in, in Blue Orchard. But, but it's true, really, understanding that there is a need to also commercialize this business and bringing it a little bit away from the pure NGO. And it's okay to do it, It's right? totally okay. because It's not going to take away from the mission. No, because, you know, it's, it's quite a philosophical uh, discussion. But if you think about, you know, if you're able to attract more capital, you're also able to deploy more capital and provide more help. So there's a commercial perspective to attract capital, yes. But the reason for doing that is, 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 is purely in order to provide help. So it's a kind of a combination. It's a fine line. 
I'm fully aware of that, but I think we're managing it pretty well. And you, um, this is this is this was the driving force for you to come on board with a company like this. I mean, the yeah, mission. For for me, it was. I mean, I mean, you know, just trying, you know, to help people and to and and to really have an impact. And you know, I mean, if somebody is a doctor, it's kind of easy. Unfortunately, I'm not skilled to to be a doctor. My <laughs> but you my also need a calling, sk- right? A doctors usually have like a calling, right? They also oh, always absolutely. they want to help people. Yeah. I think I probably also, and people working for us have this calling as well, but trying to basically, you know, make best use of the skill set you have at hand. In my case, it's financial background or legal background. So using this skill set to really transform that in really helping and, and, and doing good, it's probably the mission, yeah. We, we mentioned earlier that you're celebrating, of course, 20 years. So congratulations, because everybody knows that two decades of doing anything with passion yeah. is an accomplishment. So, so yes, congratulations. And you've, you've documented this wonderful journey in a book. Mm-hmm. Um, this is my story, where, yeah. you, where you sat down with a lot of your yeah. end clients. I mean, that must have been... Yeah. to walk down memory yeah, lane, right? Exactly. No, the idea was really, you know, there are all these books out there and everybody's writing how great they are, what they've been doing. So our ambition here was really to bring borrowers, how we call them, our end clients who, you know, historically received some money mm-hmm. to, to, to have them speak up, give them a voice and tell their stories in order for, you know, us, you know, living maybe in developed country to really understand what the effect of a couple hundred of, of dollars or rupees can actually be on people's lives. So we interviewed, in four continents, we interviewed uh, dozens of families and stories. Uh, we didn't market anything, so we just wanted to really have a mirror and showing people who unfortunately are not able to travel, in particular in these days, how, how impact is really working, what are the pros, there are, there are also cons to it, mm-hmm. people are speaking up to it, and we just try to open a little bit uh, the mirror and provide transparency as much as possible. I saw your photo in the book, so you were actually physically there. Oh, we these, are, are, these are also places that you were physically there. Yeah, yeah, we always, I mean... It's boots part, on the ground. Yeah, part of our job, you know, boots on the ground, you know, yeah. visiting people in remote areas, trying to help, trying to understand. Of course, in my function, it's maybe more a little bit a monitoring perspective because we've got people on the ground, you know, doing the groundwork. But for me, it's important to really visit people, talk to people, do projects like this book or do field trips in order to really understand the needs and assure that we we, we are always very accurate in what we are doing, that we are measuring our impact and we are always true true to what we we are actually doing. And why frontier markets? Specifically. Yeah, I mean, frontier market, I mean, first of all... Because mo- they're not easy sells, right? It's very, very difficult. I mean, if you invest, you know, you ask an investor, you know, to support you for investment in Myanmar, for example. Mm-hmm. Initially, that would shy people away. Um, so there are several reasons for that. First of all, the vulner- vulnerability in these countries is much higher than obviously in, in developed areas, right? So if you look at climate change, for example, 70% of global chi- climate change effects take place in frontier markets, whereas the bulk of the investments today still happen in developed countries. So there's, there's, there's an asymmetry here. Mm-hmm. So it's super important to have a physical presence and also deploy capital in markets where there's also need for that. And there's also a kind of a lack of transition. So if you have got from the Western world capital which, which needs to flow into developed market, the question is how would you do that? And you need an intermediator, intermediary to do that. And Blue Orchard is actually right sitting here in the middle, helping to capital to go into frontier markets, but also reverting it back to the investors. And there's so much to do. You know, poverty as for us has uh, happily decreased over the last uh, decade, as we know. You know, we were at roughly two billion at one point. Today, officially, the world organizations are talking about eight, nine hundred million. But also related to the pandemic today, we already have been seeing a peak again in, uh, in poverty. Now that you touch on the pandemic and COVID, just a couple of weeks ago, Blue Orchard launched a, a fund that, that addresses 
this, uh, the, the frontier market specifically in this area. So for us, Blue Orchard always has been an innovator in coming up with new ideas. We had the first education fund for Africa. Uh, we are responsible for the, uh, for the Paris Climate Agreement Fund, you know, which is very important for us as well. On the other side, we also launched a couple of weeks ago only the first COVID support fund. So what we realized mm. that there's a lot of grants and activities in developed countries, but there's not that much going in frontier markets. And it was very important to understand that the most vulnerable actually again here are in frontier markets. So what we did, we gathered globally the largest um, uh, development agency of the world, you know, from, from Japan to the UK to Switzerland. And we formed a fund and the fund is actually starting to deploy capital as we speak in really helping the poorest of the world, which are affected by the pandemic. So what do you say to somebody who's interested in impact investing? Get on, or you're missing the boat. No. <laughs> no, no, no. I tell them. I tell them to really, to really spend some time and try to understand what different areas of impact there is. I would love to tell them. You know, have a look. Have a look at our book. You know, or, or try to try to talk with people who are really impacted. You know, because you know, companies like Blue Orchard or Shorters will always be seen as somebody. You know, also being commercially, but I think somebody really wants to learn or understand. You know, think about, you know, the, the model of Mohamed Yunus, you know, with Grameen Bank or how these activities exactly microfinance or think about infrastructure, think about education. And again, remind people that you can do good and make money. <laughs> so if you're yeah, just coming at it exactly. purely as an investor, you can also win. Yeah, that's the beauty of this industry. I, f I fully agree. And that will be eventually also one of the reasons why this industry will continue to grow. And, you know, it's fascinating to also see all the regulators, you know, usually the regulators. <laughs> mm -hmm. We didn't talk about this, but this the, is the, a very exactly important. The regulators, they're usually rather passive, you know, and they follow financial trends in regards to the SDGs and ESG and social investment. The regulator are actually pressured by the public, so, so bottom up to really come up with very sound regulation for pension funds, for example, how the money needs to be deployed. And of course, that's an incredible driver as well. So it's, mm -hmm. it's an attack from all sides, actually. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, then, impact investing is, is really something you can come at from two angles. You either come at it from the investing angle or you can come at it from a mission angle, the idea of you know, teaching the man to fish so that you can feed him for a lifetime. Absolutely. I mean, that's basically this combination of these two areas, you know, and you might, you might have people who say, okay, I love impact because, you know, I can really, you know, teach the fisherman. On the other side, you would have somebody say, you know, I kind of like that idea, but what I really like is the decorrelation of my investment and my returns. It's fair. So you, it's fair and you've got kind of both angles. And I think our mission is to really be, be true on both aspects. And it is a fine line, very frankly. I think we've, we are maneuvering extremely well doing that. But at the end of the day, there's really two topics, you know, and, uh, and you might be, you know, in, indulged by one topic stronger than by the other one. Uh, that all depends, of course, on your background. But, uh, but uh, you know, what, what I can tell you, and I'm trying to convey everybody to that, you know, you should join, you know, us, you know, or other companies on a field trip, you know, being in one of these remote areas and really understanding what kind of difference you can have in the lives of people. And it's usually not only one individual, but you know, there's a family groups, 10 family members, then they've got great parents, it's a whole community, and you really change community without telling the people what to do. This is very important. So we're not the teacher and tell the guys, this is a grant, you know, you need to build here a, uh, you know, water source or whatever, but we really try to, 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 to give access to these individuals to build their own little universe by giving them some education, giving them some investment in order to grow. Because, I mean, just imagine, you know, if, you, if you are born in, a, in, a, in, in Congo, for example, in, in DRC, you know, and, and you have an idea or wish, you would, you would love to build your own little business and you need 100 or $200, your problem is going to be, Anna Maria, you are not in position of $100, neither is your family, mm -hmm. and a bank will never provide you any funding because you don't have a collateral. So the only way really to, to have this first step of investment 
would be through microfinance. And, and that, that is just mind-blowing. And you can revisit these individuals five, six, seven, ten years later, as we are doing, as we've got the evidence, and it's just, it's just incredible how small business can develop. Again, they are, they are not going to be Bill Gates, but suddenly you see the daughters are going into education, the number of family group members they, they reduce due to education and, 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 and you know, healthcare, of course, and the whole mindset of individual change on a net basis, really providing better lives to individuals and seeing the response by these individuals, how much, how grateful they are and how better their life is. I think that's probably the strongest signal from, from a mission perspective. Mm -hmm. Empowering. Uh, empowering, empowering and or, or basically including excluded, how we call it as well, because all these vulnerable people are usually excluded from social systems mm. or from financial system. So including these individual, they still have to play their own chances. You know, it's not us telling them, you know, they need to study, but, but they, they, there is no need to do that. As soon as people are empowered individuals, they start to develop, they move, they educate. It's, it's mind blowing to see that. So thank you, Peter, for that very top down uh, perspective on Blue Orchard. And of course, that look back over the past 20 years, that was so interesting. Congratulations for all of the work that you've done. Um, and to all of you, this is only the beginning. This is the first episode of 12 that we'll be bringing you throughout 2021. Where we're going to take a deeper dive into the work of Blue Orchard, meet some of the family, <laughs> meet some of the community, and of course, some of the partners. So a lot to talk about. And at the end, the end clients, the people whose lives have really been changed by the impact that Blue Orchard has made around the world. So before we go, Peter, any last thoughts? Well, thank you very much for having the uh, occasion being here. I think my last thoughts is, you know, this has been a this has been a history of 20 years, right? And there's been, you know, so many people who helped and supported us, employees throughout the case. You know, I believe the greatest employees you can imagine throughout the world. We've got great investors out there helping and supporting us. You know, again, from from Japan to to Zurich, you know, the largest pension fund, the smallest you know, parents, brothers, sisters, I really would like to thank all of you being part of this journey. You all have been instrumental and you've been super important making Blue Orchard to where we are today, but also helping the Thai industry. And, and I guess everybody's really having an impact. And that, that is so important. You know, it's, all, it's not only two or three people, it's really everybody who is part of this system. So I'd like to thank all of you for being here for the last 20 years, supporting us. Please continue to support us also over the next 20 years. There's much to do. We'll be here and we'll stand up every morning trying to make this a better place. So thank you for having me today. Thank you for the time and all of you for joining us.